Volcán Yaima se encuentra a 600 kilómetros de Santiago y a unos 45 kilómetros. For television viewers in Chile, images like this are all too familiar. They watch as their country is ripped apart by a cauldron of explosive fury and lethal mud flows. It's another sharp reminder of the awesome forces waiting to be unleashed from deep within the Andes mountains. This eruption, which took place in 1994 in southern Chile, is the work of Volcán Yaima. It explodes about once a decade. And nearby, there are more than 20 other volcanoes, all with similar destructive power. Yet nestled on the flanks of these turbulent mountains of southern Chile, grow some of the largest tracts of cool climate rainforest in the world. The unique character of these forests has been shaped by the forces of destruction pent up within the Andes Mountains. But the Andes have molded the forests in another way. They're a barrier which isolates Chile from the rest of South America. Isolation has had a tremendous impact on the evolution of the forests and their animals. Mountain forests are dominated by Chile's greatest botanical gift, the ancient monkey puzzle tree. Here live people and animals whose fate is closely linked to these trees. All the forests of southern Chile have shown a remarkable capacity for survival through long periods of isolation, upheaval and disaster. They are truly forests of defiance. With the Pacific Ocean to the west, the Andes Mountains to the east, Chile is like a long, narrow island on the continent of South America. And the special nature of this island can best be seen towards the south in a virtually unbroken swathe of temperate rainforest. These are no steamy tropical jungles, but cool, mysterious forests. During winter, the Andes capture the moisture of westerly storms that roll in from the Pacific Ocean. In spring, the snows are all that remain. Snow gives the many volcanoes of southern Chile a benign appearance. But this belies an ominous and brooding reality. The volcanoes are pressure vents to relieve immensely powerful subterranean forces of collision. As two vast plates of the Earth's crust grind together, the Andes Mountains are thrust skyward. But in spring, the mountains and volcanoes play another, more gentle role. They feed the snows of winter into the great rivers of southern Chile. From babbling mountain streams to the ocean is a short distance of barely 60 miles. But on that brief journey, the rivers must descend 10,000 furious feet. The extreme narrowness of Chile and the steep descent from the Andes creates rivers of great power.
These are some of the most violent waters in the world and are home to some remarkable creatures. The torrent duck is one of the best exponents of white water endurance. Even chicks take on flows that would sweep away most other ducks. Parents keep a watchful eye as their youngsters search among submerged rocks for insect larvae. They use their large, powerful feet to avoid being swept down to the ocean and to constantly defy the torrent. Torrent ducks are highly adapted to a place where specialization is essential. But at this time of the spring thaw, an intriguing strategy for survival can be seen in forests beside the river. The forests are in full bloom. The most obvious color is red, and the most common shape is a trumpet. Both are designs for success in the highly competitive world of flowers. Fuchsia is widespread. This is its native home after all. But why are so many flowers in the forests of southern Chile bright red and trumpet shaped? The answer is to be found among those who come to take nectar. But there's another creature for whom the longer trumpets are not only perfectly suited, but for whom they have a magnetic attraction. It's the hummingbird. Chile's most wide-ranging hummingbird is the green-backed fire crown. They're so drawn to the color red that 14 forest species are pollinated only by hummingbirds. As they probe for nectar, their wings beat at 80 times a second, and their hearts race at up to 20 beats per second. The fire crowns need a lot of nectar power at this time, as breeding season is almost upon them. But they aren't the only birds attracted to the forest flowers. To get to the forest, one bird is prepared to cross over the Andes, the greatest mountain range in the world. They come from southern Brazil, thousands of miles away to the east. Their route through mountain passes is a mystery. All that's known is that one day in spring, they arrive. This remarkable journey is made by a quite unremarkable bird, the feel feel, named for their repetitive calls. Such is the richness of the forest that over 40 million feel feels make this arduous journey. They too must build up energy for breeding. They need nectar. For many, the first target is the Chilean firebush, or notro, but fiofils have a problem. They're not specialist nectar feeders. Compared to hummingbirds, their hovering skills are somewhat lacking. Feel may visit five flowers in the space of a minute. A hummingbird visits 40. Though hummingbirds have the technique, feel fields have the numbers. Both are important for pollination, and both will compete for the flowers that bloom throughout summer. 
red flowering vines grow in the branches of a distinguished old koiwe, a type of southern beech tree. Their ancestors have been part of forest canopies for over a hundred million years. During this time, they must have witnessed the fall of the dinosaurs and defied many catastrophic events. And in their deep shade, others have long struggled for survival. 150 years ago, the great English naturalist Charles Darwin visited these rainforests. He hated their dreary dampness, yet he admired them. He called them primeval woods, with a character of solemnity absent in countries long civilized. He described many strange and unique creatures. Darwin's frog may take its name from the great naturalist, but that doesn't prevent it being hunted by a short-tailed snake, the only snake in these forests. But Darwin's frog has a novel way of dealing with predators. Should one come too close, it will leap away, then lie on its back playing dead. The colours on its belly are designed to confuse enemies. Only after some minutes and the disappearance of the snake does Darwin's frog complete its well-executed escape. The haunting territorial call of the Chukau is the anthem of Chile's rainforests. Scratching out a living on worms and insects, they're far more at home down on the forest floor than in the air. In common with many of the other creatures that have evolved in complete isolation from the rest of South America, and unlike the Fiofio, they have nowhere else to live but these forests. The ancestry of this free-living flatworm probably stretches back to a time when Chile, indeed all of South America, was part of a much larger ancient landmass, which eventually broke up. After that catastrophe, many inhabitants of the supercontinent found themselves in Africa, Australia, Antarctica, and of course, here in South America where to this very day, they continue their age-old struggles. Of the old continent animals, none is more unusual than Monito del Monte, the little monkey of the mountains. It isn't actually a monkey, but a strange type of a possum, long isolated in these forests. It's a relic of a lost family of animals. Wrongly, they are considered venomous. Equally strange is its reputation. To come into contact with Monito del Monte can bring ill fortune even disaster. And disaster is a very powerful force in the forests of southern Chile.
nearly a year goes by when one of the volcanoes of southern Chile does not explode, engulfing the forests in a deadly tide. They vomit huge quantities of ash and lava over hundreds of square miles. Far beyond the ring of eruption, there is always the threat of devastation caused by fire. The forests that grow in the shadow of volcanoes must defy these destructive forces or die. After the devastation, it would appear that nothing could survive or grow. Nothing except monkey puzzle trees. Alongside the skeletons of burnt trees stand a few noble survivors. Their seed, which can withstand burial in ash, will quickly return life to this moonscape. Ironically, new growth is nurtured by the lava and ash that destroyed so much. Part of their survival armory is thick bark. It's a superb insulator against fire and has helped some trees to reach a venerable old age, up to 1,300 years. It's possible the species is so old their bizarre shape was a defense against browsing dinosaurs. Monkey puzzle trees are ancient survivors from the Jurassic, a time when the world was torn apart by enormous elemental forces, forces that are just as powerful today. In 1960, Chile suffered the greatest cataclysm humanity has ever known. An earthquake registering 8.9, an unprecedented magnitude, set in motion thousands of landslides, avalanches and mud flows. Tens of thousands of people lost their lives. Whole cities were flattened. Forests were decimated. Nearly 40 years later, the chaos wrought by that earthquake can still be seen. This valley sank more than six feet, drowning over 12,000 acres of floodplain forest. As if in defiance, a new dynasty has arisen from the remnants of absolute disaster. The cry of the Walla signals the dawn of a new day in the Rio Cruces wetland, one of the largest and most important in all of Chile. Where hummingbirds and fiofios once disputed red flowers, black-necked swans glide in harmony. Egrets and other wetland birds rub wings with forest edge types, like this spectacled tyrant. All live in full view and in staunch defiance of those agents of great destruction. After the earthquake, olivaceous cormorants, the only ones in Chile to nest in trees, quickly set up breeding colonies. Chile has few other natural wetlands, so marsh-loving birds like the buff-necked ibis soon arrived. The shallow water between stumps and fallen logs makes good hunting ground and welcome cover. Numbers of many species are increasing. This new realm of the kingfisher is important for all of Chile. Rio Cruces gives hope for this whole new dynasty.
reeds give cover to a nesting black-necked swan. Her mate is close by. They call to each other for reassurance. Even though they peer for life, without this frequent contact, she still might not recognize him and would possibly drive him away. Their floating nest is anchored to an old forest tree stump. It's a long way from the shore and it's a long way from the eyes of predators. After hatching, the cygnets spend little time in the nest. Soon, they will join their parents out on the open water. The old flat valley floor, flooded to a depth of a few feet, has created ideal feeding over a wide area. Very little of the bottom is beyond the reach of their long necks. The dutiful parents give their chicks a lift straight to the best feeding areas. Since the wetland received official protection in the mid-1980s, black-necked swan numbers have increased from just 50 pairs to 500. Within 30 years of one of the most powerful earthquakes in the recent history of the world, the Rio Cruces wetland has attained international recognition. It shows in the best possible way the resilience of the landscape and the wildlife. This is the weather that southern Chile knows best. Rain. An average of 16 feet of it every year. And it's the rain that gives life to more than 25 million acres of rain forest. From the mountains to the sea, many unique species grow according to the dictates of climate and catastrophe. And in the past 500 years, they have witnessed very different forces of catastrophe. Close to the northern forest boundary flows the Rio Bio Bio, a river that marks an important and dramatic boundary in the human history of the rainforests. The original people of the forest were the Mapuche. Many lived by hunting and small-scale slash-and-burn agriculture. But 500 years ago, the world of the Mapuche was turned upside down by a series of catastrophic events. Spanish conquistadors swept out of control across the continent. Their goal was conquest. Their means were brutal. But in Chile's southern forests, they met their match. The Mapuche rose up and pushed back the Spanish all the way to the Rio Bio Bio. For three centuries, its powerful white waters became La Frontera, a border that the Spanish rarely crossed. And the Mapuche, who lived in the forest to the south, became the most feared of all the native peoples of the Americas. Eventually, the Mapuche were overcome. Their relationship with the forests, though still strong, is even now being challenged.
It is high summer. A Magellanic woodpecker chisels at the trunk of a beech tree with great force. Each blow seems savage enough to cause brain injury, but woodpeckers possess within their skulls built-in head protection. The male has the bright crimson head plumage. The female is dark. Having taken the hard-won grub, the woodpeckers will repeat the effort on another tree. They move on, leaving the tree trunk to others, with even greater head protection. From their ornately designed antlers, these beetles have been given the name flying deer. Their antlers, which have developed from mouth parts, are now quite useless for feeding. Their only function is adornment and fighting. These jousting bouts usually take place over ownership of something seemingly as mundane as a piece of tree bark. But victory in the possession of bark is very important to a male flying deer. It is a place from where he can entice and mate with a passing female who possesses very small antlers. Once this frenzy of stag beetle passion is spent, she will fly off and lay her eggs in the leaf litter of the forest floor. By this time, most hummingbird chicks have hatched in tiny, concealed nests way out on the ends of branches. Grandmother probes for sap in holes left by the woodpeckers and wood borers. Though there are still plenty of red flowers about, sap is a welcome source of minerals so necessary for the growth of her chicks. On her return, she regurgitates the rich infant formula into their gaping mouths. Hers is just one of several nests in the territory of a single male hummingbird. He plays no part in the rearing of young. He is so intent on defending his territory that he's just as likely to flash his head feathers aggressively at his females as at any other bird. The intruders that he spends most of his time repelling are trying their best to raise a family nearby. Both male and female feofields work together to raise their chicks as quickly as they can. Cooperation is essential if the whole family is to be ready for the long journey back to southern Brazil in just six weeks' time. They no longer take nectar as many fruits and insects have now become available in the forest. Feeding young isn't their only concern the whole season's breeding effort can all too easily come to nothing. The weenia, or forest cat, dines well on field field at this time of year. With so many feel feel in the forests of southern Chile, it's not surprising that they receive the close attention of predators.
kudu are not only the smallest deer in the world, they are perhaps the rarest. They are found only in the inaccessible depths of the Chilean rainforest. No bigger than a dog, the pudu's cuteness is a factor in its rarity. Many are taken for pets. A fawn, less than two months old. A small hope for their continued survival in the forest. Pudu are most likely found where there is a dense understory of bamboo. The most common and aggressive bamboo is keela. It climbs up to 60 feet into the branches of forest trees. The flowering of keela is a rare and hugely significant event in the life of the forest. It happens once every 30 years and sets off a chain reaction that's felt by all who live here. As with many bamboo species, once it has flowered and set seed, the keela dies off completely in the following season. Everywhere, there is dead and dying vegetation. But what looks like a disaster is in fact a life giver for the forest. The time of keela die-off is also a time of renewal. It's a once in a 30 year chance for young forest seedlings to break the stranglehold of bamboo and reach for the sky. This is the time to find a place in the forest before the rampaging growth of new bamboo smothers them once again. There are other benefits as well. As the dying leaves rot, there is a massive release of nutrients back into the soil to enrich and rejuvenate the forest. But country people see the die-off as a bad omen. They say that when the keela blooms, there will be hunger. Their gloomy prediction is based partly on the loss of fodder for livestock. But there is a more serious reason. After flowering, a phenomenal amount of highly nutritious seed is produced and the seed becomes a magnet for the unwanted. They call this ratada, the rat plague. All sorts of rodents, but mainly long-tailed rice rats and olivaceous field mice, turn this once in three decades seed bonanza into an explosion of rodent babies. As months go by, seeding occurs in different parts of the forest. The ratada moves on, eating everything in its path and multiplying. The great horned owl and other predators follow the progress of the rodents. But then the situation changes. The ravening hordes finally exhaust the supply of seeds and in their frantic search for food, they pour out of the forests by the million. They invade farmhouses and barns. Nothing can be done to stop the onslaught. They destroy harvests and spread killer diseases of both people and their livestock. This plague of rodents and the loss of harvest and stock food, combined with the great risk of disease, is why country people say that there will be hunger when the keela flowers. The fortunes of country people can be changed dramatically by the flowering of bamboo because their livelihood resides in the forest. They've been harvesting the forest in ways that have changed very little for thousands of years. The impact of people has always been small and sustainable. But 
But earlier this century, the nature of the relationship changed dramatically. It was to have an impact on the forests that was greater than the forces of eruption and earthquake that they have defied for so long. In a few years, over 700,000 acres of ancient, slow-growing trees disappeared. This country has one of the oldest stands of giant trees in the world. These immense and valuable woodlands cover one-fourth of the nation's land surface and launch a new industrial program, timber! Winter takes over North America, but this is summer on the slopes of the Andes. Sawmills are in full operation to play a major part in logging, conducted in cooperation with the United States Forest Service. Mmm! Mmm! These Chilean boys give their all. Roll em, boys! Roll em! And here she goes, ready for the saw. Since those glory days of logging, and since the beginning of wood chipping, the pace of clear felling has doubled. Huge steaming piles of wood chips awaiting export in the ports of South Chile are but one symbol of the fate of the 45% of the country's native forests which have already disappeared. The highly prized Alerse trees that once covered this Andean hillside will never be seen here again. Their growth rate is so incredibly slow that a tree is at least 200 years old before it produces seed. The few remaining stands of Alerse, conifers related to the giant redwoods, are now protected. This Alerse is one of the oldest trees in the world. When Christ made his appearance on earth, it was already a thousand years old. Now in the evening of its life, it still has the vigor to produce fertile seeds. Monkey puzzle forests were also logged extensively. They too now enjoy protection, mainly within national parks high on the flanks of the Andes. The Mapuche name for the monkey puzzle tree is Pewen. So sacred and important is it to one group of people that they call themselves Pewenche, people of the monkey puzzle. As summer progresses, the cones begin to swell. The nuts within, which are a vital food of the people, are ripening. This is the most important time of year in the Pewenche calendar. The time of their festival, the Niatun. During the Niatun, Pewenche communities gather to stage an important ceremony of thanksgiving. At the center is a young monkey puzzle tree. Around the tree, young men ride vigorously to disperse any evil spirits. They also ride to recall the acts of daring and courage which helped repel the Spanish invaders so long ago. They come together for two or three days to give thanks to the tree at the center of the ritual and at the center of their lives. of the Niatun is to give thanks for previous harvests and to make offerings which will ensure a bountiful harvest of nuts this year. A 
few weeks later, another festival of the trees takes place among flocks of screeching austral parakeets. They're the first to announce to the forest that the pignons, the monkey puzzle nuts, are ready to be harvested. This is an event of great importance, not only to the Pawenche, the monkey puzzle people, but to many animals of the forest. The austral parakeets, or kachanyas, are first to the feast. They use their strong, powerful bills to bite into the cone and then crunch down on the nuts within. Typical of parrots, they're messy, wasteful eaters. And so beneath the tree, a steady rain of nuts attracts others. In more remote places, even the shy pudu may emerge. Though lured from their forest hideaways by the exquisite flavour of the nuts, pudus are always wary. Such is the attraction of the pinions that the rare Darwin's fox will ignore the pudu and tuck in to this nutritious nut feast. At this time of year, old enemies can dine together at the same table. The nuts so enjoyed by so many animals are, of course, the monkey puzzle tree's seeds, and the austral parakeets play a vital role in spreading them. In this, they're assisted by tundukos, another of the many South American rodents. They will obligingly take the nuts away and cache them for the winter. But as they usually forget where they've hidden them, tundukos play their part in planting seeds for new generations of monkey puzzles. The kachanya, the austral parakeets, hold pride of place in Pawenche folklore. Their screeching calls and poor table manners also lead people to well-laden trees. There's a great variation between the harvests of some years and others, and between the quantities of nuts on each female tree. The nuts of the monkey puzzle tree have long made life possible here in the foothills of the Andes. But there is a paradox here. The near tomb remains a vital and ancient ritual designed to give thanks for the harvests past and future. But the relationship is changing. The trees are being asked to produce more than the people need. Increasingly, the nuts are being gathered and sent to markets, where they're highly sought after and can earn much needed cash. But this means the Pawenche are gathering more nuts each year, and the supply may not be guaranteed either by the trees or by the annual ritual of the near tour. If there are insufficient nuts left for regeneration of the forest, then both the people and their trees will suffer. A month later, the pignon harvest is finished, 
but other trees are still fruiting. The Kachanyas are still announcing to each other, and the forest, each new crop. The Kachanyas will soon leave the high mountains, but before they do, they gather the last of the forest's bounty. Her mother can still find seeds for her chick, which is now ready for flight. The end of the main forest harvest marks the approach of winter. Powerful rivers are now placid. The mountain snows have all melted, but the trees are again beginning to turn red. As the red notro flowers were the signal for the season of plenty to begin, the red and yellow leaves of beech trees high on the slopes of the Andes signal the end. by the first snows. This is the signal for the elusive Andean deer, or Huemul, to come down from summer heights and make their way into the depths of the forests. The Huemul is one of Chile's national icons. It even graces the Chilean coat of arms. Yet that's about as close as most Chileans will ever get to it. Hunted for years, this normally trusting animal is now rarely seen and is close to extinction. Fortified by their time in the forest, most of the fields have completed nesting and are preparing for their epic journey back to southern Brazil. In the tightening clincher winter, the Fiofios must ascend to 12,000 feet to find their way through the mountain passes. For such a small bird, it's an incredible journey in defiance of the elements. The forests of Chile also constantly defy the elements. Monkey puzzles have been doing it since the time of the Jurassic when dinosaurs would have eaten the tasty pignon nuts. They remain at the forefront in defying their turbulent and overbearing neighbors, the Andes Mountains. And it's the Andes, stretching from one end of Chile to the other, that ultimately dominate this land of extremes. <laughs> 